Temperatures pushed close to minus 25 last night. It would be the coldest night in Scotland for about 25 years. This cold brings one fungus to my mind, the chaga fungus, in Latin the Inonotus obliquus. It is a mycelium marsh which grows on trees around the northern boreal regions of the world. And it's got two particular uses which are going to help warm me up today. The first is to make a nourishing medicinal tea which can purportedly raise your body temperature. The second is an excellent fire lighting mushroom. So let's have an in-depth look at the chaga fungus today. The part of the chaga fungus which we're going to harvest today is not actually the fruiting body of the fungus. It is known as the sclerotium, which is a mycelial mass which goes on the outside of the tree. Because of the touted medicinal benefits of this fungus, unfortunately it's attracted various unscrupulous characters here to Scotland who've been over-harvesting this mushroom in order to powder up and sell online. That's led to a bit of a scarcity. The fungus simply can't keep up with demand because it takes about seven years to replenish. However, I've found a spot about two miles away in that direction where I've seen a good-sized shaga. I think uh, today I'm going to take these skis and ski over there for about two miles because walking is going to be a bit of an effort in this snow. Happy? Fancy a ski? So here we have the amazing Inonotus obliquus, or the Shaga fungus as it's known in Siberian. As I said before, it's not the fruiting body of the fungus, it is actually a mycelial mass known as a sclerotium. Um, and it's black and dark orange. It causes white rot to the host tree, but the host tree can happily live with the Shaga fungus on it for 10 or even up to 80 years. At this stage of the fungus, the Chaga conch is actually sterile and doesn't have a sex. Um, it's only when the host tree dies that it starts to fire these tubes up the tree that then come out at an amazing 20 or 30 degree angle, which is almost in line with the declination of the earth. And then at this stage, it's quite a mystery to mycologists whether the spores that it releases are spread by air and wind or are they spread by insects. That's because it's so rare to find the fruiting body of the chaga that it's often referred to as the holy grail of mushrooms for mycologists. Here's a couple of images of the fruiting bodies. You can see the birch bark has actually split apart and the fruiting bodies are starting to erupt. So these are super rare and you'll probably never see them unless you're very lucky. Uh, you can see all the little, the little tubes there which, in which the spores will be released. Apparently the spores are very attractive to insects, um, which, is, which is why there's one theory about their reproduction being carried on insects. So there we are as well. A very rare sight in the forest. So where might you find the amazing Inonocius obliquus? Um, well, in Scotland in particular here, I've only ever seen them on birch trees and they do grow on beech trees here as well. And I've seen an enormous one on a beech tree before. They grow all over the northern hemisphere in that subpolar boreal forest area. And uh, I believe in other countries they will grow on pines and conifers and things like that as well. If you want to find a shaga fungus, I suggest you look in a long established birch forest where it's going to have a long established root system and mycelial network around it. What you're going to look for is this amazing charcoal like black and brown growth that's going to be erupting from the bark. Now, the colour of the shaga fungus is due to a very high content of melanin and oxalates in the fungus. We'll look at some of these later because these are some of the compounds that give it its amazing medicinal features. The shaga fungus is an incredibly tough and resilient fungus, being able to put up with those incredibly cold sub-zero temperatures that you find around the northern hemisphere in the boreal forests. It's also being exposed like this on the outside of trees, capable of uh, surviving huge amounts of UV radiation. It's also very successful at seeing off pathogens and viruses and that sort of thing. 
and uh, in nature it's often the most uh, adaptable and tough fungi like this that we find has the biggest medicinal bang for the buck in terms of medicinal strategies for animals and humans. The shaga fungus has been used throughout history for ritual, medicinal and recreational purposes. The name shaga is actually a Siberian word and that's because it's been used in Siberia since at least the 13th century and probably way way earlier. The nomadic reindeer herding tribes of the Kanti peoples and the Evenk peoples have been using this fungus for medicinal and ritual purposes for a long long time. They would often brew it into teas and hot water extractions famously to ward off tumours, liver disease, stomach ulcers and they would also burn it in the summer to get rid of those pesky mosquitoes and uh, burn it for a kind of ritualistic incense. If we go further east we find that the Chinese and the Japanese peoples, especially the Ainu people of northern Japan, have also been using this fungus for very similar purposes. Burning it, often smoking it and um, in ancient Chinese medicine it's been purported for liver health, heart health and uh, to support the defensive power of your qi, your internal energy in Chinese medicine. If we cross the Pacific Ocean we'll find that this fungus, the chaga, has also been used for a long time by the Native American peoples of North America. Tribes such as the Cree, Ojibwe, Algonquin and Denesuline have all been using the chaga. They've been using the chaga for a long time for things like uh, rheumatic pain in joints, toothache, stomach upset and probably tumour growth. I believe they would also use it to fight off infections and viruses if they had a suppressed immune system. Um, in terms of the smoke of the shaga, I believe they would use it in pipe ceremonies and also as a kind of ritual cleansing smudge that would uh, not only get rid of insects but also probably evil spirits. It's the Native American peoples that have an amazing creation myth with the shaga fungus. It involves around the legendary hero and trickster called Wasisajak. Now one day apparently he was out hunting chickens with rocks, throwing them at them. But the problem was, every time he tends to throw his rocks at the chickens to hunt them, he would let out an enormous fart. Now apparently these farts were scaring away all the chickens. He heated up a rock, put it on the ground, and he sat on the rock to try and heal his digestional pain and stop this awful gas. And in doing so, he managed to burn his bum so badly, in fact, that he grew a big scab on one of his bum cheeks. And uh, apparently he took this scab, he peeled it off and he threw it at a birch tree and it was that scab that created the amazing shaga fungus that we have today. Now according to the Denesiline peoples of northern Canada, the shaga can also be used as a divination device to tell the future. They had a ritual called the Etzendek where they would powder two lines of shaga and they would ask a question of the shaga such as Will the coming crop be bountiful or will our hunt be good this season? And they would burn from the edges the two piles and they would assign one side of the pile yes and one no and whichever side reached the middle first, they would be your answer. If you are considering harvesting the shaga fungus or any other medicinal mushroom for that matter, I'd like you to think about the concept of reciprocation and giving something back to nature. Why not plant a native tree or help out your native ecosystem? That way we can be sure there's going to be an abundance of natural resources and natural medicines going forwards into the future. As I mentioned earlier, this sclerotium of the shaga does take a long, long time to produce itself. And thus, if you over-harvest it, you're in danger in, in your country of just running out of this amazing natural resource. Um, so today we're only just going to take a very small part here. I think I'm going to take a little bit from this side here because it looks like it's the healthiest. Um, I'm just going to chop a little bit off with a knife. I'm just going to very carefully weaken a little bit here. And big, you know. And I don't want, of course, want to damage the tree either. So I'm being careful not to dig too deep. There we have it. Managed not to harm the tree and uh, it's a nice clean cut on the shaga there. Where I've chipped a bit of the shaga off here, you can really see the difference between the black outer crust and the more brown, orange, ochre coloured interior. The interior is a lot more like hard cork and the outer surface is more like hard bark. Um, 
The interior and the exterior of the shagged fungus actually have different uses. So for example, the outside um, will make a different kind of medicinal tea from the inside. And also for fire making, I believe the inside is softer and will catch an ember more easily, whereas the outside would be better for friction fire making. This bracket fungus here is the Fomus fomatopsis, also known as the hoof fungus or false tinder fungus. It was carried by Otzi the Iceman as an ember and fire lighting device. Alternatively, Chaga fungus is known as the true tinder fungus. So let's see if its fire lighting abilities live up to its name. A bitterly cold northeasterly wind has started ripping across the moor here. So I think it's time we headed into the igloo and lit some candles and see if we can warm the place up a bit. I've got the little Chaga fungus fire kit here, complete with a bit of leather to catch the spark, a piece of pine that's been feathered. We've got some birch bark, which you know combusts really well because of the oils and tars in it. A bit of cotton wool, a great ember catcher. And of course, the star of the show, the true tinder fungus, the shaga fungus. So let's see if we can land some sparks in here and uh, light up the candles in the igloo. So I've got a piece of shaga here, um, which I've split off this main conch. And, uh, Kind of impy. So we're going to try and land a bit of spark in there and see if we can get an ember. So I'm just trying a spark directly onto the conch here. Oh, got an ember already. The dog has left. Got some decent embers. We were discussing the ritual uses of the smoke earlier. It does actually smell quite nice and kind of smells a bit like tobacco actually, which I'm surprised at. Right, so I've got a wee ember here, made of my knife. Whee! Let's get these candles lit. I thought I'd show you actually another close-up of just how emberous the shaga became because it was so impressive. I think this would just happily smolder away. It kind of smells a bit like tobacco but with some notes of vanilla and maybe chocolate. I mean it's a, it's a very pleasant smell, I'd almost consider using it as an incense. Well, I think that's definitely deserved of the title, the true tinder fungus, just because the sheer heat and the speed in which the ember spreads and was able to actually ignite birch bark there with almost no intermediary tinder. Scary sparks scare you away. The scary shaga fungus. Scary mushroom. All this smoke in here, I think it's time we made a little air hole to the outside world. Now we've used the shaga to light our candles in the igloo and it's feeling a little bit warmer. We've got a ventilation hole to let some of that smoke out. I think it's time we got our shaga medicinal tea on and see if it can indeed raise our body temperature because I feel like I need it right now. So I've got a little a clear flask of water here. I've got a little alcohol stove and the shaga fungus. So I'm just going to break a few chunks off and uh, let's light this stove up. If you're interested, this was just Amazon's choice kind of bog standard ethanol burner. Just burning bioethanol. Um, a 95% pure one, denatured. So the stove is now on. Just give it a minute to heat up. In the meantime, let's break off some chunks of chaga. I believe a lot of people powder their chaga um, with a grinder, coffee grinder type of instrument. Um, but I'm going to just cut it into kind of chunks because I've only got the knife here. I've got about half a litre of water here in my flask and about maybe just over a 
teaspoon. If you thought about this as powdered sugar. So let's pop that in our flask. The reason I chose the clear flask is because I want to show you the amazing color of the water and how it's gonna change as we brew this nourishing medicinal tea up. So it's minus four outside, but the combination of the candles and our Shaga brew have really pushed the temperature up inside the igloo. And we are at a lovely positively warm 4.3, so that's 8.3 degrees warmer in here than it is outside. And uh, it's quite comfortable even with gloves off. Oh, I've been given a bowl delivery. Return this to the sender. 4.3 degrees is the warmest I've felt in a couple of months actually. Uh, whilst I wait for the brew to brew on for maybe another 15 or 20 minutes, I am going to tuck into Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life. How fungi made our worlds, changed our minds and shaped our futures. So our Shaga brew has been on about 35 minutes now and it's starting to get that amazing characteristic coffee-like colour. And that is because of the high contents of melanin in the fungus. If you were making shaga tea inside your hot water extraction, you'd probably want to use about two tablespoons of ground shaga per litre of water. In terms of cooking times, you want to simmer it gently for about two hours. That way you can be sure that you're extracting all the water-soluble compounds and goodies that are going to possibly benefit you medicinally. Amazingly, this little alcohol stove has been burning for about 40 minutes and still got loads of fuel left. So I think we'll maybe run the, run the boil for another 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, tuck in and see what it tastes like. It's starting to smell really, really sweet now. Very similar to the smoke actually that came off it. Kind of almost a candy floss vanilla type of smell. Once you've brewed up your chaga tea, don't throw the chunks of chaga away. You can actually dry them out and reuse them two or three times and you'll still extract quite a lot of goodness. After that, you could dry them out and retire them to your fire lighting kit. Right, I don't want to reduce my shaga tea down anymore, so I'm going to take it off the heat. We've been going about 45 minutes now, and you pretty much can't see through it anymore, so I think it's probably ready. Beautiful, almost espresso-like colour. Extinguisher. I'm impressed, we've still got a fair bit of fuel left and it's been going so long. You can see the colour of the shaga tea there now. It's amazing, almost kind of sunset orange espresso type colour. So we simmered our shaga tea down probably by about half, so we've probably got about 250 mil now. And I feel like because of the rarity of this fungus, we should give it a full kind of fully blown tasting review with tasting notes and everything. I'm afraid the camera battery conked out in the cold there, so I had to go in and recharge it and uh, return at nightfall. So I'm just heating my chaga tea back up on my stove here, and we'll do a little tasting session in a minute. Um, but I thought I'd tell you in the meantime some of the medicinal properties of the chaga fungus. First thing that's so noticeable about the chaga is that amazing colour. Now that comes from the melanin in the fungus, and it's very high concentration of melanin in a fungus. And um, that's got a few really interesting antioxidant effects, along with the copper ions and the melanin and some tyrosine, which is an amino acid in the fungus. The combination of these actually stimulated melanogenesis in uh, human cells, which actually, conversely to what I thought, would make your skin whiter rather than darker. I thought maybe the melanin would go into your skin and actually give you more pigment, but it seems to do the opposing thing. Now, the two compounds that we're actually going to extract from this chaga fungus which are going to be a benefit to us are the polysaccharides and also the betulin. Now if we absorb that through our hot water extraction, it's going to have a really interesting anti-cancer effect in our bodies. It can target cancer cells whilst leaving healthy cells unaffected. It seems to be particularly effective against cancers like melanoma and also vascular cancers. 
This has been shown in mice trials and also in human cell trials. The second really cool compound we're going to get out of the chaga fungus is polysaccharides. Now these are a class of antioxidants and in, inside the chaga particularly we can look at the beta-glucan class of antioxidants. Now they're going to protect our cells against oxidative stress and free radical damage. Um, particularly useful for immunomodulation. So if your immune system is suppressed for instance and you're getting lots of colds and flus the beta-glucan antioxidants in the chaga can actually upregulate it and help you fight off some of those infections. So that may be quite useful at the moment in the uh, current pandemic. And if, on the, conversely, if you have a serial overactive immune system, it can actually help downregulate that. So it's, a, it's got this amazing sort of up and down immunomodulation effect where it can just get you right where your body needs to be. There was an interesting mouse study which showed extracts of the chaga mushroom reduce the weight of the mice and increase their body temperature, which is quite useful when you're filming in an igloo. And um, when they were implanted with these particular vascular cancers, the chaga seemed to be able to stop the proliferation of these vascular cancers in the mice. So quite some promising evidence there of the anti-cancer and also some other interesting effects such as raising body temperature. There's also been some really interesting studies where the chaga compounds have interacted with the bifobacterium in our stomachs and had a positive net effect on our ingestion. And also if people have been suffering from things like gastric upset due to inflammation in stomach ulcers, the um, compounds in the chaga fungus seem to be able to act as an anti-inflammatory and actually sort of bring down that inflammation in the stomach. So it's got some quite interesting internal uses as well. I believe it's also used uh, by diabetics and it has a kind of anti-diabetic effect. Um, and also traditionally was used for liver disease. So it's got amazing host of effects where you've got the betulinic acid, which is kind of anti-cancer. And then you've got these polysaccharides, which are antioxidants protecting your cells. You've got an anti-inflammatory effect, um, which is good for your stomach and also other parts of your body which may be suffering from inflammation like injuries and joint pain and that sort of thing and even this this uh, interesting interaction with your skin where it can actually lighten the pigment in your skin um, so yeah I think it's it really reinforces what the ancients knew and shows us that uh, they were using it for all the right reasons really the chaga was relatively unknown in Western Europe, well, it probably was in the past, but until recently, until 1968, when Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the author of the Gulag Archipelago, brought the Chaga fungus to light in his novel, The Cancer Ward, which was a semi-autobiographical novel. I'll read a little bit out here. In uh, Solzhenitsyn's Cancer Ward, there's a character called Oleg Kostoglatov. Now he develops cancer and is bombarded with a kind of brutal radiation treatment to get rid of this cancer and he laments in the novel and wishes that he could have the what he calls the peasant's cure which is chaga and he writes he could not imagine any greater joy than to go away into the woods for months on end and break off this chaga crumble it boil it up in a campfire drink it and get well like an animal and this was uh, yeah 1968 and that kind of thrust the old chaga fungus there into uh, the public eye in western europe and the Western world, and since been the study of, of various sort of research papers and things. But anyway, let's try it out and see what it's like. So it's got this definite sweetness which you could pick up in the, in the steam there when it was boiling. It's sort of like a mixture of candy floss, vanilla, a little bit of that, um, you know, artificial smoke machines, there's, there's the, almost that sweet kind of sickly smell in the smoke. There's like an element of that which is actually reminiscent if you've ever woodworked with birch wood um, or, or smelt birch tar in, in the bark of birch. It's got this amazing kind of sickly but really pleasant um, sweet smell. It's kind of like a caricature of that, of that birch sweetness. Um, it's quite a, a full-bodied kind of drink uh, and quite syrupy but actually doesn't really taste of much at all. It's got this slightly dry metallic finish where it seems to sort of dry out the edges of your tongue. Um, you can really imagine the, the kind of coppery, um, sort of coppery, slightly ferrous taste that washes over your tongue when you drink it. I hope it's going to raise my body temperature anyway because it's probably hovering around. What is it? Let's see what the temperature is in here. Minus 3.4. Oh no, yeah. 
minus 3.4. So it's not that toasty at the moment. Anyway, cheers. Now it's all well and good igniting your shaga fungus if you have access to a fire steel or a flint because you can land a spark into it and we've seen how well that works. But what if you didn't have any of those tools? What if you just had, say, a piece of uh, branch or stick that you'd cut off and the shaga fungus itself? Could you use, for instance, a bow drill or a hand drill to ignite your shaga? I'm out in particularly challenging conditions right now. It's kind of in between snow and rain and I've got my shaga fungus. I'm going to, because I don't have three hands, I'm going to find somewhere to wedge the shaga into an old root of this birch tree here, like so, to isolate it. And then I'm going to try and create a source of heat uh, by hand drilling onto the shaga fungus. And let's see if we can create an ember. And we've got a little bit of rain coming down as well, so it's going to be very challenging conditions. Let's see if we can do this quickly. So, switch to bow drill power because my hands are just a bit knackered. Let's see if we've got anything. So, you can just see, luckily that rainy wind is starting to pick the ember up there. Let's see if we can get some tinder in there and create a flame. So luckily we've managed to do the impossible and with a bow drill and the amazing true tender fungus, the shaga, we've managed to create a huge smouldering ember in the rain. We've done it, we've just put a couple of bits of pine on there. You can see that. Just feather off some pine and sprinkled it in. And we've got flame. So I've brought my Shaga ember inside the igloo because there was just so much rain outside. But amazingly, throughout all that rain, it's kept burning. Hey hey! So I've got the candles lit now and my hands are starting to defrost a little bit. It was really interesting there. Um, first attempt with the hand drill to light the fire, which was probably 90% there, and I think if it hadn't been raining, I would have been able to do it. Uh, but a combination of my arms literally getting so tired and the skin on my hands uh, was so dry, I couldn't grip the stick, which is why I switched to the bow drill power, which worked a lot more effectively. And uh, what was amazing was that despite the rain, in probably 20 seconds or so, I managed to get an ember with the bow drill. And that ember stayed lit all the way back from the forest into the igloo and then we could light our fire in here. I suppose it gave me a, a really interesting perspective what it'd be like to be a Paleolithic man in a desperate situation like that where the weather's coming in and you've only got one shot to make fire. It gave me great respect for them and probably the speed and efficiency they had and the skill and stamina with tools, fire making tools like hand drills and bow drills. But also um, gave me a perspective of how important a tool like shaga fungus would be to carry around with you and actually depend on, well, I suppose in some situations your life would depend on it. So there's two more things I want to try with the shaga fungus and the first is going to be tie-dyeing this white cotton t-shirt and whilst I'm doing that I'm going to try and make a shaga hot chocolate to warm me up. So I noticed yesterday when I was working with the shaga fungus that it was dyeing the ends of my fingers brown, a bit like iodine does. And I suddenly remembered that uh, in natural dyeing of fabrics you want to find plants that are very high in oxalates in order to fix dyes into them. And uh, shaga not only has a really vibrant colour but it also is incredibly high in oxalates. So that would make it 
in my book um, a dye and a fixative in one. So what I'm going to do is, is boil up a tea just as you would if you're having medicinal tea. So I'll crumble some bits up into this pan and uh, simmer them for about an hour or two, two hours. Uh, and in this pan simultaneously I'm going to add the tea shirt and I'm going to add a load of salt and I'm going to let that soak uh, whilst the tea is getting ready and the salty water is actually going to help the fabric accept the dye and then once it's, uh, once it's been dying for a while in the pot I'm going to add it to this tray, scrunch it up, pour the dye over and we should get a kind of interesting tie dyed effect so let's see if that works and get this water nice and salty and just leave the t-shirt in there for about an hour and a half to get all that salt absorbed I'm going to put that briny water on a very low heat just to help the salt break down and get into the cotton so for our dye I'm going to cut off about a third of this piece of shaga here and I'm going to crumble that into our pot of water try and get it as small as possible so I'm going to chop it up a little bit more I'm going to strain I've been a bit naughty and added some grass fed butter to it as well Add two good spoons of cacao powder two of those and some honey lastly sweeten it let's give that a blend really creamy right the t-shirt's been soaking for about an hour and a half in the salty water now and I'm just gonna wring out any excess <laughs> can see I actually dropped some of the shaga in there by accident it's already it's already done that so I think this is going to be hopeful. So the dye has been boiling away for two hours now and every 15 minutes I took a little test sample of some kitchen towel and you can see the gradient of the dye there becoming more concentrated and I'm quite happy with where we're at now so let's go ahead and do the t-shirt. I can show you the colour of the dye now. It's like tar. It's amazing. If I don't use all of this I'm going to keep some of this for tea anyway. I'm going to get a fork I'm going to start twisting from the centre. So you see, we want our spiral to start here. Try not to pierce the t-shirt. We want to create as an even spiral as possible. So make sure all the folds are folding nicely. You can encourage them a little bit if you need to. So, move the fork. Tuck everything in as best you can. So now I'm actually going to, I don't have any elastic bands with me, so just old fashioned, I'm going to tie it off with some string four times, just using a simple knot. It's just going to hold the spiral together so it doesn't come apart. Okay, we're just going to do some diagonally as well. One more. Okay, got a few loose bits here I'm just going to tuck in, likewise there. Okay, right, I'm going to get my plastic tree so I don't dye the table brown and uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to find the label side and I'm actually going to just pour the dye over half of my spiral and you'll see why later. Ok, 
carefully going to pour the dye just over this half. Try not to bleed it too much onto the other side. I think that side's good and saturated now. I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to do the same half on the other side. So we've dyed half of our spiral and hopefully not too much is going to leach onto the white side. Um, in order to stop that happening I'm just going to leave it dye side down in the tree and uh, leave it for maybe a good sort of four or five hours just so the dye can soak in. It's only been one and a half hours but I'm too impatient and I can't wait any longer to see what it looks like. The grand reveal. <laughs> Brilliant. What do you reckon, Impy? Ah, oh, so happy with that, that's awesome. <laughs> the Shaga spiral tie-dye. Although it's a bit damp, I'll put it on and model it for you. The grand reveal. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed this video, and uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, and there'll be lots more mushroom and crafting related content coming soon. <laughs>